Thanks very much for that introduction and thanks for the opportunity to address your gathering today. I'm, I'm uh, sort of zooming in from, uh, of all places, Las Vegas, Nevada, um, which is a, uh, obviously a city with all sorts of ecological uh, resonances, potentially resonance uh, uh, of, of interest to a gathering like this one. So uh, as I uh, mentioned briefly earlier, I do not have a PowerPoint. I'm going to read uh, my paper and sort of do things old school in that way. So uh, my paper is entitled Apocalypticism, Environmental Politics and Christian Muslim Dialogue, uh, to, to state that again. Convention holds that eschatologically oriented religion neglects the natural environment. Why worry about preserving nature or busying oneself with concerns over environmental justice if the proper concern of religious life is to prepare for the life to come? Such a criticism of the religious was perhaps most forcefully articulated in Friedrich Nietzsche's polemical writings contained in works like The Genealogy of Morality. It was given contemporary currency in Lynn White Jr.'s remarkably influential thesis and discussed and over-discussed, uh, where White labeled Christianity specifically in Judeo tradition, uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, that is, in general, as essentially world-denying. In the United States in the 1980s, political figures like James Watt, the uh, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of the Interior embodied Christianity's cultured despisers' worst fears. A dispensationalist evangelical, Watt believed Christ's imminent return and implicitly, perhaps not so implicitly, the world's imminent conflagration meant Christians held no real responsibility to care for creation. Similar concerns were echoed among environmentalists more recently when an outsized number of Christian evangelicals were appointed to leadership positions in the George W. Bush administration from 2000 to 2008. This paper will not explore the fairness of criticism that apocalyp uh, Christian apocalypticism is necessarily ecologically destructive, though there's plenty of reason to question its merit, at least as it's applied indiscriminately to all Christian believers. Fair or not, however, Christians who take issues with climate change, uh, to take issues like climate change seriously, must likewise take criticisms about their religion's apocalyptic imagination seriously. One way they might be helped in doing so, I argue, is by engaging in a greater dialogue with Muslims, for whom the apocalyptic impulse does not instruct necessarily a negligent attitude for worldly concerns. I wish to illuminate specifically some Quranic interpretive practices that, when, when deployed in Christian hermeneutics, might serve to countermand environmentally heedless interpretations of apocalyptic biblical literature. Now, at first blush, Quranic wisdom may not seem to improve much upon Christians' eschatological excesses. I mean this in the way the Quran clearly sees the natural world and all it contains as possessing instrumental value for the purpose of serving human beings. While the Quran and Hadith literature indeed do express an appreciation for the value of non-human life, there's also a sense in which that value is subordinate to human life. Hadith literature, for instance, permits dispatching with certain rodents or birds or dogs and snakes when they're a bother or a nuisance to humans. At points in the Quran, moreover, humans are said to be more valuable than all other forms of life. There's also the problem, at least to an ecological point of view, of the way Allah is said in the Quran to have elevated humans to a privileged position, that of vesigerency or Khulafa Allah, above all the rest of creation. Uh, I'll quote here uh, from the Quran. Do you not see that Allah has subjected to humanity whatever is in the earth? Uh, that's asked at Surah 22, the chapter which also lays out the expectation, uh, expectations and practice of the Hajj. Insofar as a commitment to anthropocentrism is sort of assumed to be a measure of, of religious environmentalism that's on a steadier ethical footing than the Christian apocalypticism I noted just a moment ago, passages containing commitments to a distinctively ontological anthropocentrism like these in the Quran 
do not bode well for Islam, nor for the productive comparison between Christianity and Islam I've promised, at least uh, subjecting it to a sort of ecological hermeneutic. It's precisely the overwhelming eschatological focus of Quranic literature, however, that makes that comparison possible. For Allah, the Quran tells us, bestows an authority over creation on humans, not just for the purposes of domination, but also for the purposes of evaluation. An evaluation, that is, of humans' obedience and gratitude to God. The creation's foremost purpose is to point beyond itself, the Quran tells us, to signal God's ultimate power and goodness. The Quran says humanity has every reason and indeed no excuse for not believing in God due to how full of signs the world is of God's glory. As such, the creation is thought to attend to human life not only in our material needs, it's also, uh, it also is a, a kind of measure of assessment for humanity's faithfulness. This is the point I want to emphasize here. This is because the natural, non-human world is the sphere in which God's will is both actualized and seen. Allah may test you, the Quran says in Surah 6, with what God has given you. That's the end of that quote. Submission to God's will is obviously of prime concern in Islamic practice. There is no God but God, no God but Allah. Those who admit competitors into their relationship with God are consistently condemned. There's any number of references I could give. Yet this need not mean God's unparalleled standing merely be delineated by reference to God's might. God is also described in the Quran as merciful. Along these lines, God's creation is described in the Quran as a gift of God's grace. There's sufficient reason then when we take into account the idea that God's sovereign power is enacted in creation as a gift of God's grace, for us to see God's primary relation to the world as it's told in the Quran to be evident in God's ongoing creative will. This idea is palpable in Islamic tra tradition that Allah is continually involved in the world's making and remaking. The creation is being recreated in every moment. That process of recreation is evidence of the sustenance and guidance of God's hand, or as the point is put in Surah 10, God originates creation, then resurrects it. Perhaps at this point, it's becoming clear uh, what direction my argument is, is headed in. If submission to God's will is prior to all forms of commitment is in Islam, and that will is evident in God's providential and creative maintenance of the world, then the act to submit oneself to God necessarily entails the act to involve oneself in the world's maintenance. This, I think, is a primary facet of the test of obedience Islam prioritizes. The Quran explains the centrality of obedience in Islam in plainly eschatological terms, namely by insisting that submission to God is necessary to preparation for judgment day. In the passage I just cited from Surah 10, Allah's creative power is named alongside Allah's power to judge the faithful from the unfaithful, nearly in the same breath. Indeed, God originates creation, then resurrects it, as I just uh, read from that passage, but it continues, so that God may justly reward those who believe and do good. Elsewhere, we see a similarly emphatic so that with regard to humanity's faithfulness in the creation. I'll read now from uh, the second surah. O humanity, worship your Lord who created you and those who before you and, and those before you, so that you may become mindful of God. So just as God is the Lord of creation and just as God is merciful, so too God is a judge in Islamic tradition. Now, to state my claim explicitly, Allah gives the gifts of creation to human beings according to God's role as judge. The creation's use is the very test upon which humans will be graded when judgment day arrives. It's in this sense that Islam's eschatological emphases counteract the potentially detrimental understanding of human priority in Islam or of human vesigerency. Abusing earth not only violates Allah's will, but also violates one's dutiful 
commitment to submit to that will, while caring for creation, on the other hand, fulfills it. Importantly, my aim in bringing insights like the ones I've briefly highlighted from Quranic apocalyptic literature is not merely to appropriate Islamic insights for non-Islamic contexts. Uh, religions like Christianity cannot somehow be made better by consciously importing conceptual resources from outside the tradition. Such a practice strikes me as carrying the same methodological assumptions as those employed by theologians who believe the uh, the import of a new set of cosmological values is all that's required for increasing a given religion's capacity for ecological sympathy. There are valuable lessons to be gleaned from Quranic wisdom, however, in Christian communities who center their hope in the apocalyptic imagination. One is that the exploitation of the earth, or much less a heedlessness of earth's value, is incompatible with an affirmation of divine sovereignty, such as what both Muslims and Christians typically avow. In the portions of the Quranic texts I've lifted up here, the vicigerancy uh, of humans is seen as ultimately subordinate to uh, divine sovereignty and will. Human authority over creation, the human difference from the rest of creation, that is to say, or what um, Christians and Jews historically have affirmed as being humans possessing the image of God, this carries with it a responsibility to care for the world that God created and that God cre continues to create within. That world, our world, both bears the signs of God's will and serves it. There's also reason to think the creativity Islamic apocalypticism emphasizes might also ramify positively uh, in the Christian apocalyptic imagination. Just as humans are expected to respond to God's creative action in the world with worship, gratitude, and ultimately submission, Christians also, also bear a responsibility to honor God upon whom they wait to install a new heaven and new earth and to wipe away every tear. That's from the 21st chapter of Revelation. All throughout the book of Revelation, just as in the Quran, creation is evocative of signs, signs that are intended to uh, less to provide an intellectual proof of God's identity um, than to evoke a sense of gratitude, of absolute dependence on God's gift of life. Now, the elements of Islamic tradition I've spotlighted are a good reminder to Christians that the responsible observation of the creation's wonders also entails caring for its flourishing. Lest one fail the test of faithfulness, God promises to administer in the eschaton. Thanks very much.